Our next speaker is Lennart Groot, who has generously accepted our invitation to share with us his perspective from the very long and outstanding career he's had in design, engineering, and architecture. In the way of a brief introduction, in 1986, Lennart joined the architectural studio Rogers, Sterk, Harbour and Partners, recently renamed RSHP, where he's a senior partner. He's been principally responsible for managing the practice's international projects. I'm going to super date Lennart by sharing with you that Lennart actually worked on the Pompidou project all those years ago as an engineer, then joined Richard Rogers and has not looked back since. One other thing about Leonard that I can share with a warm heart is that as a young student, he did have some interactions with the late Professor Henneman, one of the founding partners of Ramble. Leonard, over to you. Thank you, Hussein, for that introduction, kind introduction. And to start with, I shall try to answer one of your questions, which was, what was my contact with Rumble and Hanneman? Professor Hanneman was professor at the Denmark's Technical University, where I was a student. And I was present at a number of his lectures. And more than that, he actually was one of the assessors for my final project at the university, which was a rather ambitious conference or concert hall with a concrete arch system for the roof. I think he was a bit frustrated with me because I spent too much time designing the concert hall, the acoustics and the layout, rather than concentrating on the detail of the concrete structure design. But he was always very kind and tolerant with my approach. Architecture, architecture and society. I would do this at a number of levels. At the business level, how do you approach it as a business? How do you approach it from the public point of view in politics and publications? And how in our design, whether it be at the city level, the building in its context or the occupants of the building? Richard Rogers, who established the practice, which is now RSHP, was always intent that there should be no ownership of the, of the partners of the practice. And that if there is, was any excess, that that success should be shared with those who had less. And to that end, he created a charitable trust which owns the partnership and the deed which we call the Constitution, has as its preamble the following that I have on the slide, but which I'll read because of its importance. The practice of architecture is inseparable from the social and economic values of the individuals who practice it and the society which sustains it. We as individuals are responsible for contributing to the sustainability of our environment, to the society in which we practice, and to the welfare of the team with whom we work. To this end, we agree that ownership of the practice is wholly devolved to a charitable trust so as to ensure that all the capital value of the enterprise and an annual dividend or donation are directed to charitable purposes and that by the surrender of private share ownership, both private trading and inheritance of shares is eliminated. It has always been our aim to ensure that our work is beneficial to society and to exclude work that is knowingly considered directly destructive to our environment and social fabric. Written 40 years ago, this is as fresh today as it was then. This has led to some of the principles which we try to apply to our design and buildings, city and context, the importance of the city, integrity of our buildings, the integrity of our design, adaptability for future use, sustainability, obviously highest on the agenda, community, the whole community involved around our work and obviously the economy and delivery of our building. Politics and publications. While architecture can, does strongly contribute to our environment and what the, the, obviously the built form around us, Richard felt that in order to actually change things socially 
and otherwise, you need to engage with a broader public. And that led to him participating and doing the Rees lectures and the production of his books, The Cities for a Small Planet, and engaging himself in politics, whereas Lord Rogers, representing the Labour Party, he was tasked as chairman of the Urban Task Force, which through their work developed the political statement around towards an urban renaissance, which advocated the regeneration of our city centers and the reuse of brownfield sites and derelict land, derelict land rather than encouraging urban sprawl. We work at all scales, the city being the, obviously the starting point and we, we were employed by the then president of France with a number of teams to look at what the future of Grand Prairie might be in the 21st century. The key problem facing the Grand Prairie was that you had a core, the, what we know as Paris, this 20 arrondissement, which was wealthy and successful, surrounded by a whole range of communities around it called the banlieue, where you had a very varied population and who were excluded to a large extent for the benefits of the center. So we, the study undertaken was to look at how you could reinforce the connections between the center and the banlieue, reconnect the banlieue by creating a public transport ring around the city and a whole range of small interventions to, inc to improve the permeability between the banlieue and the center. The other major project with regard to cities is the one in Madrid, the Nueva Norte, where the infrastructure scar left, well, present due to the railway infrastructure has separated the uh, urban fabric between the two sides of the, the rail infrastructure, but at the same time leaves a huge swathe of land which can be developed six kilometers from the Chamartine station out to the M40, which bounds the, the city of, of Madrid, where urban centers can be created and connectivity to the surrounding environment can, and uh, uh, surrounding environment can be created. By developing the, the redeveloping the Chamartine station, with the opportunity for create, creating a new central business district, the financing coming out of that can be used to, to bridge over the railways, to create parkland and connectivity to the communities on the other side of the railway. A new smart city to be developed in the future. The Centre Pompidou is obviously a great cultural contribution to Paris, but originally it also was a major piece of regeneration for that part of the city, which was in a no well-developed situation. With the closing of the Leal, there were swathes of land that were not properly used, and there was a lot of deprivation in the area. The key driver apart from the architecture of the building, was to have a building that did not occupy fully the site. So that half the site we call the piazza, a people's place where people could, could gather and enjoy the environment and the building. The facade itself was originally accessible. The escalator was a public escalator, so you could rise up to the top of the building. Unfortunately, with the success of the building, originally designed for 5,000 visitors a day, and we easily attain 25,000 these days. That escalator now has now been reintegrated into the museum and you can only uh, access it if you enter the museum. The other major urban development is the Barangaroo South Master Plan. Again, this is a major piece of urban regeneration 
On the left, you can see what is the Barangaroo area, which was old industrial land that had been used subsequently as container port and cruise liner uh, port. The, the, the existing CBD on, uh, to the east was separated from it by roadways and the denivelation. Lendley's, our client, took the brave decision to say that in order to, to make a successful development here, you had to have a critical mass. So the three towers of some 300,000 square meters of office space and large areas of retail, f and and housing were all constructed in one go. A brave decision considering 300,000 square meters in a city of 5 million people was certainly uh, uh, something that brought with a, a major level of risk. But have, as the whole master plan and the ground plane was designed as a highly permeable, friendly, accessible space, the plinth full of retail and f and has attracted people through from the, the, from the existing center down to the waterfront and has now created the most successful part of Sydney. And the office spaces were occupied at 60 or 70 percent at the opening day. Even in China, we achieve a number of changes in the way housing developments are perceived. From on the left, the typical serried ranks of buildings in a gated environment. Here, the client has accepted that we have these diagonal access roads that enable people to traverse the, uh, the development to get to their work because there are um, station infrastructure on either side. This enables people to enjoy the, the um, landscape and the amenities that are built within the development together with the inhabitants. Buildings in that context, the Leadenhall building, obviously the planning authorities have dictated that with the particular views, we had to slope this building to ensure that we didn't encroach on the view of St Paul's. But what was more important was the decision to lift the building these four to six floors off the ground in order to create a new public space. Interestingly, studies in, in Denmark on, on typical streets in cities demonstrated that only about 6% of the space available was actually dedicated to pedestrian traffic. So there is always this major shortage of public space for the individual within cities. This, together with the existing small placenta next to the building, has created a major new public space for people to enjoy from the surrounding offices. We, have, we were asked to develop a site into what was particularly high wealth individual residences and retail. But it, our intention right on the start was to avoid what typically takes place is a gated community. As you, the site, which is that building, which I'm indicating here next to the Hotel de Paris and the casino was a, was a closed block. The proposal we came with was we can see again the Hotel de Paris and the casino, the, the, the building blocks of the residences are set aside and we have created a whole new public avenue between the buildings, allowing access for people to, around the buildings. There you can see the, the, the avenue between the buildings and there's no vehicle access, all that is below grade. So the ground plane is left and contributed back to the city. The building and its occupants. 
This is Chifley, A Chifley Square in Sydney. Again, here we see the contribution to the cityscape by lifting the building off the ground. Furthermore, within the building, there are these levels, the central level and the roof, which become, they are of course for the users, but they create spaces, garden spaces for the users. And here we introduced the concept of villages, inter interlock villages for the offices. And interestingly, the owner, Murbeck, in there, when they're publicizing and selling or renting out the space, their words for it are, at once both timeless and revolutionary, A. Chifley Square remains at the leading edge of commercial space thinking and is one of the first office towers in Australia to incorporate vertical villages across the entire building, enabling visibility and collaboration across the workplace, together with stunning views and abundant natural life. There you can see the vertical villages, the views, and the way that people can be working together. The Cancer Center at Guys, again, there's a similar concept of villages, but this for a different purpose. Given the nature of cancer treatment, it is something which is obviously people in those conditions are in a vulnerable state. We do not want to have a large uh, single building where people were, uh, were sort of sort of lost in there the way there was approached. So we created what we would call these villages, treatment villages. And so you have the radiology village, and we actually persuaded the client to lift these heavy radiology rooms out of the ground. There was what's called the one-stop village for other treatments. We had a chemotherapy village, and then at the top, there are actual uh, hospital beds for people who have to spend over, overnight. And the, the advantage of being that once you arrive in the welcome area and then set up in, into your village, you find an environment which is of a human scale and friendly and not something that's intimidating, and you're amongst people who are having the same treatment and therefore you feel yourself in a far better psychological situation. Finally, how do we achieve better housing and better living? Offsite is something that has been talked a lot about and it's been difficult to realize, but we managed to do four projects with offsite manufacturing, two for the YMCA on the right, of meanwhile living in Lewisham, and a new development in Cardiff of individual houses. Obviously, the whole advantages of, of the offsite is, is speed, far faster build. There's no disturb, far less disturbance on site because there's, there's no heavy vehicles other than bringing in the modules. And the quality is of a different character. Basically, the, the quality in, inside these individual dwellings is such that we would call it tenure blind. The only difference really in, in between a, what would you call a low cost social and a, and a, and a um, uh, owner occupied is, is the quality of the equipment in the kitchen and the bathrooms. The actual environment inside is, is unique and the ability of offsite is to create targets of net zero. And on the Cardiff project, in fact, we are expecting to be net positive. That's it for me. Thank you very much for listening.